Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Picture Partners webinar on the state uh, budget tax changes. Uh, my name is Craig Watman. I'm one of the partners in our tax team here at Picture Partners in Melbourne. Um, very good afternoon to you all. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, and we trust that you're all doing as well as possible um, during this current lockdown. So just a bit of housekeeping before we get into the content. Um, there is a Q&A function. You will see at the bottom of your screen a little box that says Q&A. We are very much hoping to have time at the end of the presentation for your questions. So feel free as we go through the presentation to type your question into the Q&A box and then we'll do our very best to get to it at the end of the presentation. Uh, we have three very experienced mem members of our tax team presenting to you today. We will be starting off with Irina Tan, who will be covering the stamp duty changes announced in the budget and also the new windfall gains tax that was announced by the state government pre-budget. She'll be handing over then to Jessica Gahang, who'll be taking us through the land tax changes that were announced in the state budget. And finally, Alana Bog Bogomilova will be uh, taking us through the payroll tax changes that were also announced in the budget. Just before we get into the stamp duty changes, um, Picture Partners has been active in, in voicing its concern in the media since the announcements came out both pre-budget and in the budget regarding the impact of these tax changes on the property industry and also on home buyers. Um, while we are grateful for the concessions that Irina will take us through in relation to stamp duty, they will certainly assist a number of our clients in the property um, industry in general to clear some of the outstanding stock in the city of Melbourne area. We are concerned um, that on the one hand, the government has provided those concessions, but on the other hand, has imposed these tax increases by way of stamp duty and land tax, and perhaps most significantly announced the new windfall gains uh, tax. The new windfall gains tax is of significant concern for us, particularly in the regional areas that it is going to apply to. We believe that it will be um, passed down the development chain and um, therefore significantly impact the prices which consumers will pay for, for land lots or house and land packages in the regional areas. And in some cases, we also believe that it's gonna put a handbrake on the projects such that they will no longer be feasible. So uh, we are part of the Property Council's advocacy to the state government. There will shortly be commencing a consultation process in relation to the windfall gains tax. I'm part of the group that will be consulting with uh, the Victorian Treasury and the State Revenue Office on that in conjunction with the Property Council. But we do encourage all of our clients who share our concern about the impact of the windfall gains tax to voice your own concern directly to the treasurer because the more voices that are heard in relation to that, the, the more impact we are likely to have in terms of ultimately shaping how this windfall gains tax is imposed and importantly, what transitional measures may be available to protect existing projects. So with that introduction, I will uh, hand over to Irena to take us through the stamp duty changes. Thanks, Irena. Thanks very much, Craig, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all keeping well and also keeping warm and dry, especially at the moment. Now let's get right to the first of the new stamp duty budget measures. Um, the first measure we are looking at today is a new premium stamp duty rate. Uh, property transactions with a dutable value above $2 million will be subject to a new premium duty rate under this measure, where the duty payable will, will be $110,000 plus 6.5% of the dutable value over $2 million. Unlike the premium duty rate in New South Wales, the new premium rate in Victoria will apply not only to residential land, but to all types of land, including industrial and commercial land. This new rate will apply to contracts entered into from the 1st of July, 2021. Contracts entered into before the 1st of July, but which settle after that date will not be subject to the new premium stamp duty rate. 
The Victorian government has estimated that this measure will impact less than 4% of property transactions. But as those in the property industry are aware, and as mentioned by Craig earlier, this measure along with the other budget measures are likely to put a handbrake on investment and development activity. And stamp duty is a key cost that often gets passed on to end purchases. And therefore, those purchases are unfortunately expected to bear part of the additional GD liability indirectly. Now, let's have a look at a quick example. Um, assume that you have a company that is not foreign for GD purposes in Victoria, and this company acquires properties with a total value of $10 million. If the company acquires the properties under contracts pre 1st July, the total GD payable would be $550,000 using the rate of 5.5%. But if the company acquires the contracts, sorry, the properties under contracts on or after the 1st of July, the total GD payable will be $630,000. That is the company would be paying GD at an effective rate of 6.3% which involves an additional GD liability of $80,000. Now, the next slide shows the GD comparisons using the new versus the current rate of GD applied to various dutable values. And as you can see, generally, the greater the dutable value, the more pronounced the impact of the premium rate in terms of the resulting overall effective rate. The next slide also shows that the new premium GE rate will also secure Victoria in the first place in the country in terms of having the highest stamp GD costs generally on the purchase of a property if you ignore any GD exemptions or concessions. And th this table here is one that we contributed for an AFR article recently. And if you look at the column with the numbers highlighted in blue, you'll see that you'll be paying $121,000 currently on a purchase of a property worth $2.2 million in Victoria, which is higher than the equivalent purchase in other states. And after the new premium GD rate kicks in, that amount will go up to $123,000 in Victoria. Now let's move on to the second stamp duty budget measure, which is a temporary widening of the off the plan GD concession. And unlike the new premium GD rate, thankfully this measure is a positive one. Where the off the plan GD concession applies, the purchaser pays GD not on the full purchase price under the off the plan contract, but on a lower value as calculated under one of two possible methods therefore saving on the stamp duty payable. And as many of you are aware, from the 1st of July, 2017, the off the plan duty concession is only available to purchasers who will use the property purchase off the plan as the principal place of residence. And if the dutable value of the property is below certain value ceilings, being $750,000 for first home buyers, or $550,000 for non-first home buyers. And accordingly, not every purchaser will be eligible for the off-the-plan stamp duty concession on their off-the-plan property purchases. If a purchaser is eligible, so if a purchaser is not eligible for the concession, the purchaser would be liable to pay stamp duty calculated on the full market value or the full purchase price, whichever is greater. Uh, in respect of the property. Now, under this new stamp GD measure, that dutable value ceiling will be increased to $1 million, but other requirements will remain the same. For example, the concession will still be limited to home buyers and investors will still not be able to access the concession. This new measure applies to contracts entered into between the 1st of July, 2021 and the 30th of June, 2023. 
If the commissioner determines that a contract dated on or after the 1st of July 2021 replaces a previous contract for the purchase of the same property entered into before that date, the increased ceiling will not apply. So in other words, there is an integrity measure there to prevent people from basically updating the date of an existing agreement to come within the scope of the new measure. Now, this measure naturally could result in quite significant stamp duty savings for a purchaser. And we thought we'll include an example here. So assume that you've got Daisy, an Australian citizen, who signs the contract to purchase a premium apartment for $4 million to occupy or to use as a principal place of residence. And let's also assume that at the time she signs the contract, no construction has commenced. Now, if Daisy signs the contract before the 1st of July, 2021, unfortunately, Daisy will not be eligible for the off the plan duty concession, which means that she would have to pay duty of $220,000 calculated at 5.5% of the $4 million purchase price. If she signs the contract on or after the 1st of July, 2021, it's a different story as she may qualify for the concession. If we assume that the apartment is in a building of four more stories, which is classified as high rise by the Victorian State Revenue Office. And if we assume that we are using the fixed percentage method for calculating the GD payable under the off the plan concession, the dutable value would be $1 million in this example here. And under the fixed percentage method for high rise building, the percentage deemed to represent the amount paid for the construction of the building is 75% if no construction has started as at the date of the contract of sale. You then take away 75% of the purchase price for four, from $4 million, which leaves behind $1 million which is the dutable value on which duty uh, would be calculated, which translates to a duty liability of $55,000. If Daisy signs the contract on or after the 1st of July, 2021, in the absence of any duty concession or exemption, the duty payable would be $240,000 using that new premium duty rate discussed earlier on the full purchase price of $4 million. If Daisy obtains the off the plan concession, she would save $185,000 as she would only have to pay $55,000 compared to full GD of $240,000. This example also illustrates that whilst the new premium GD rate kicks in from the 1st of July, 2021, in this example, it's clear that Daisy should not rush to sign a contract before the 1st of July as she would be in a better overall stamp duty position by signing the contract on or after the 1st of July, 2021. Now, another positive stamp duty measure is a new temporary residential duty exemption. This measure is for bona fide purchases of a new home, and we'll look at what that means later. Located within the city of Melbourne local government area, and we'll also look at what that means later, that has been unsold and unoccupied for 12 months or more since completion, where the dutable value is no more than $1 million. This measure applies to properties purchased under contracts entered into between the 21st of May, so 18 days ago, and the 30th of June, 2022. This exemption is not just for home buyers, investors may also access the exemption. And the exemption unfortunately does not apply to the foreign purchaser additional GD. It also does not apply to landholder GD. So if shares or units are acquired in a company or a unit trust that owns such property, GD will be payable per usual and this exemption unfortunately cannot apply. Now, if all the requirements are met, except that the property is unsold or unoccupied for less than 12 months post completion, while a 100% GD exemption will not be available, 
a 50% UD concession is available. This 50% concession applies to properties purchased under contracts entered into from the 1st of July 2021 to the 30th of June 2022. And please note the different start dates. Um, the 100% exemption measure applies to contracts entered into from the 21st of May, but this new, um, this 50% concession measure applies to contracts entered into from the 1st of July. This 50% duty concession is in effect a limited extension of the current 50% duty waiver for purchases of new residential property, which is an existing measure that was introduced in last year's state budget and which ends on the 30th of June. The difference is that the current waiver applies to all new residential properties, regardless of location, whereas the new measure that starts from the 1st of July, 2021 is limited to residential properties within the city of Melbourne area. And there is an integrity provision designed um, to prevent parties replacing contracts to come within the new exemption or concession, similar to the one mentioned earlier in respect of the off the plan GD concession. Now, in relation to what a new home means, a new home means residential property that was not previously occupied or sold as a place of residence and not previously used as short-term accommodation. So if a property has not changed ownership but has been leased, unfortunately, that property will not be a new home and will not qualify for the duty exemption or concession when the ownership does change. Now, the City of Melbourne local government area covers properties in the 14 suburbs shown on this diagram, including Kensington and South Yarra, to the extent they fall within the boundaries of the roads shown on the diagram here, which are probably too small for you to see here, but a larger map can be accessed through the City of Melbourne website. It may not be enough to rely on the name of the suburb in which a property is located and we recommend that you check whether or not the property actually falls within the boundaries of this map. So for example, an apartment located along Chapel Street does not fall within the City of Melbourne boundaries for South Yarra. Now, Moving on to the next slide, using the previous example involving Daisy and her 4 million apartment purchase, if the apartment is within the City of Melbourne area and the contract of sale is entered into on or after the 1st of July 2021, based on our reading of the draft legislation, she may combine the off the plan GD concession with the new residential GD concession uh, for, for, for properties within the City of Melbourne area. And doing so would further reduce the duty payable by Daisy uh, from $55,000 down to $27,500. Uh, $27, and as mentioned earlier, in the absence of an, any duty concession, the duty payable would be $240,000. So Daisy could save up to $212,500 in stamp duty. Again, this is based on our reading of the draft legislation and we look forward to receiving confirmation from the State Revenue Office that you could in fact combine the two concessions once the bill has um, passed Parliament. So those are the new stamp duty measures from the recent state budget. In addition to those measures, as Craig mentioned earlier, the government also announced a new tax described as a windfall gains tax um, and this announcement was also made last month. Now, this tax is uh, proposed to be based on the value uplifts due to rezoning decisions. And this tax is proposed to apply from the 1st of July, 2022. So it won't, it's not proposed to start right away. And it is proposed to apply to uplifts of more than $100,000 um, due to rezoning decisions. The tax is proposed to apply in respect of rezonings between zone types, for example, from industrial to residential, rather than between sub zone subcategories, for example, from a general residential zone one 
to a general residential zone two. And the government has announced that rezonings that will be exempt are rezonings to public land zones, as well as rezonings to and from the urban growth zone within the growth areas infrastructure contribution area. Now the tax is up to 50% of the uplift where the uplift is $500,000 or more. And where the uplift is between $100,001 and $499,999, and the tax payable is 62.5% of the uplift above $100,000. So the taxes phase in for uplifts in that range. The uplift is the difference between the value of the land before and the value of the land after it is rezoned as determined by the value general of Victoria. The Victorian government has stated that liable parties will have the option to defer paying that liability until the next dutable transaction or subdivision of that land. And as Greg mentioned, draft legislation introducing the new tax is not yet publicly available. And we expect a consultation process to begin very shortly in respect of this new tax. We do have a case study later in this webinar that involves this new tax and the other state budget measures, including land tax. And as mentioned earlier, many of these new measures are expected to place a handbrake on investment and development activity. And the case study will illustrate how the operation of all these new measures can significantly increase development costs, which could simply make developments unfeasible. And even where developers can make projects work, the stamp duty, land tax, and windfall gains tax would need to be factored in as a development cost, which would very likely result in the price for the developed lots increasing and making the lots less affordable for buyers. Now, on that note, um, Jess will now take you through the land tax measures and later that case study that shows the impact of all these budget measures. Over to you now, Jess. Thanks, Irina. Um, so straight into it, the first land tax change we will cover today is the change in the tax-free threshold, which from 1 January 2020 will increase from $250,000 to $300,000. And the increase in the threshold applies for land tax rates applicable to both absentee and non-absentee individuals and companies only, which means that the threshold for trusts will remain unchanged at $25,000. For the first time in over 10 years, the land tax rates will increase for properties with a taxable value of $1.8 million or more. Um, these land tax hikes apply from the 2022 land tax year to both the general rates and to the trust surcharge rates of land tax. The hikes apply equally to both absentee and non-absentee owners. You can see from the tables on this slide that the land tax rate for properties with a taxable value between $1.8 million to under $3 million has increased from 1.3% to 1.55%, which is an increase of 0.25%. And for properties with a taxable value of $3 million or more, the land tax rate has increased from 2.25% to 2.55%, which is an increase of 0.3%. The rates for the trust has increased by the same percentage points uh, for each bracket there. Now a 0.25% um, and 0.3% land tax height might not really sound like a lot, but if we have a look at the next slide, we have a comparison of the land tax payable under the current rates versus the new rates to give us some idea of what the hikes translate to in dollar terms. So you can see that for a property with a taxable value of two and a half million dollars, the difference is only $1,750 per year. But for a property with a taxable value of $10 million, the additional land tax payable is $24,000 a year. So for taxpayers holding an asset long term, that's really quite a significant increase to their land tax bill on an annual basis. 
While this slide shows how a taxpayer's land tax bill may be affected on a single holdings basis, on the next slide, we have an example of how the increase in land tax rates can affect those who hold multi-tenanted properties. For example, taxpayers who hold office buildings, shopping centres or other commercial property. So in this example, we have a commercial building which is comprised of 40 tenancies and the taxable value of each individual tenancy is a million dollars. And so the aggregate taxable value of the land held by the landlord in this case is $40 million, so 40 times a million dollars. The landlord passes on land tax to its tenants as an outgoing on a single holdings basis. Uh, for those of you who don't already know, single holdings basis means that land tax is calculated as though the only land held by the landlord is the land occupied by the tenant. So in this example, the landlord passes on land tax of $2,975 to each of the 40 tenants, um, which is a land tax calculated on $1 million. And given their 40 tenants, the total land tax um, the landlord is able to pass on to its tenants is 40 times 2975, which is $119,000. But the landlord is assessed for land tax on the aggregate taxable value of all her tenancies, so on the $40 million figure. So under the current rates, this means the land tax payable by the landlord is actually $857,000. So really the landlord is out of pocket um, around $740,000, which is $857,000 minus that $119,000. That's under the current rates. Under the new rates, the land tax payable by the landlord will increase because of the land tax hike and the, the new tax payable will be around $970,000. Um, but the amount the land tax, amount of land tax the landlord can pass on to the tenants doesn't actually change. So it remains the same at $119,000. And that's because there hasn't actually been an increase to the land tax rates for properties with a taxable value of less than $1.8 million. And that's a single holdings calculation. That means that under the new rates, the landlord will be out of pocket $850,000 rather than $740,000. So I guess what we're trying to show is that the increases to the land tax rates will further increase the gap between the land tax that the landlords of multi-tenanted properties need to pay versus what they can actually recover from tenants. Before I get into this slide, um, I thought we would take a trip back to the uh, 2018 when the vacant residential land tax was first introduced. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with this tax or who need a brief refresher, the VRLT is a tax that applies to homes in the inner and middle suburbs of Melbourne that were vacant for more than six months in the previous year. It's calculated as 1% of the capital improved value of the property. At the time the VRLT was introduced, the property market was at a peak and there was also a severe shortage in rental stock. And the policy behind the introduction of the tax was to encourage landlords to rent or sell their vacant properties in inner and middle Melbourne so that Melbourne's housing stock was used more efficiently. Now, despite this policy intent, the way the VRLT has actually been enacted is such that it not only applies to landlords who weren't making their properties available, but it also applies to developers who, um, who have completed an un unsold housing stock. Currently, there is what is a one-year exemption from VRLT that is available for homes completed in a year preceding the current tax year. But due to COVID, um, the downturn in the market meant that developers who were unable to sell completed housing stock or they were experiencing significant delays in settling stock, even where they were actively marking, um, marketing the property for sale or for rent. Uh, the property industry made quite a lot of um, noise about this and what the government has done in response is introduced what is essentially a two-year exemption. So from two, year, two years from completion, the property will be exempt from VRLT. There is a caveat on this exemption, however, which is that the land must not have been 
uh, must not have changed ownership and it cannot not have been used or occupied since completion. Um, I'm hoping this um, example will make that slide a little bit easier to understand. So in this example, we've got Heaven Homes that purchased vacant land in Doncaster in 2018. And on that land, it built 10 townhouses. Um, in September, 2020, the certificates of occupancy were issued for those 10 townhouses. And as at January, 2022, the townhouses have not been used, occupied or sold. So. Um, are they going to be eligible for the two-year exemption? Um, houses would be exempt from the vacant residential land tax in 2021 because they became residential land in 2020. And we know they became residential land in 2020 because the occupancy permits were issued in September 2020. Unfortunately, that exemption doesn't extend to the 2022 land tax year um, because the six townhouses remained unsold as at 1 January 2022, and therefore they will all be subject to the VRLT in the 2022 land tax year. Now, we have instances where some of our clients have hundreds of unsold apartments that haven't been sold um, and that were completed pre-COVID. And if you think about having 100, 150 unsold apartments valued at around $800,000 a pop, uh, that's VRLT of about $800,000 a year on top of your land tax bill. So it can be quite a significant cost. Under the new rules, however, the landowner in this um, example would receive an exemption not only for 2021, but also for 2022. So it's effectively a two-year exemption from completion, as I said before. And just noting that we're only eligible because we didn't actually sell or rent out our apartments. Um, if, if we did do that, we wouldn't be eligible for the exemption, of course. The next change relates to how land held by a nominee on behalf of a partnership is assessed to land tax. And this change is actually consistent with how we understand the SRO already assesses partnerships with the nominee entity. And what the legislation does is that it deems each partner in the partnership to have a beneficial interest in the partnership property. Um, which means the partnership is treated as a fixed trust for land tax purposes, with the nominee entity being the trustee and the beneficiaries of the trust being the partners. So that this means that the nominee entity can notify the commissioner of the, of the partner's beneficial interest in the part, partnership property. And the consequence of this nomination is just with any other nomination as for a unit trust or a discretionary trust, is that the nominee will be assessed to land tax at the general rates rather than at the trust surcharge rates. Um, and then each partner will then be individually assessed on their interest in the partnership property, plus on any other taxable property they own, plus on any other interest in partnership property that that partnership has. Um, and then a credit will be applied for any land tax that's already paid by the partnership in respect of the partnership land, such that the partners aren't paying double land, double land tax. I appreciate that the previous slide may have been a bit confusing. Confusing. So hopefully this example will show how the provisions work. In this example, we have four partners in a partnership. They're all Australian citizens and each of them have a 25% interest in the partnership. The nominee of the partnership is Accounts Plus and the, the nominee holds land in Hawthorne with a site value of one and a half million dollars on behalf of the partnership. In the 2021 land tax year, Accounts Plus was assessed for land tax in the amount of around $12,000, and that's based on the trust surcharge rates because it's treated as a fixed trust. So Accounts Plus can notify the SRO of the partner's beneficial interests, and if, he, if, they, if it does choose to do so, as, as a result of that nomination, Accounts Plus will be assessed at the general rates. 
of land tax, which works out to be around six or $7,000. Um, so compared to when a nomination was not in place, Accounts Plus is paying about $5,500 less in land tax. Now, each partner will then receive an ended an individual assessment if they own other taxable land. In this case, each of the partners do not own other taxable land in their name and therefore they won't receive individual assessments. Just moving on to some of the other state taxes measures that were announced. Um, I won't spend too much time on these ones because they are um, relatively unimportant compared to the other changes. Um, so the first one is that it was, an, it was announced that the land tax exemptions for private gender exclusive clubs would be removed from 1 January 2022. However, we are not yet to see the legislation that gives effect to this measure. So we will update you on that as um, the legislation is released. The bill also introduces a provision which is relevant to taxpayers who have entered into a shared equity arrangement with the state. And for those of you who aren't familiar with a shared equity arrangement, it's where the government helps home buyers to purchase a home by contributing to the initial capital cost. And this allows the home buyer to purchase a home with a lower initial deposit. When the property is sold, the government receives their contribution back with a proportionate amount of equity. And what this provision does is to say that the state's interest in the property will be excluded for the purposes of assessing land tax um, to the taxpayer and also for the purposes of considering the taxpayer's eligibility for any land tax exemptions or for any concessions. Lastly, the bill introduces this provoned this is pre-2006 land, so not relevant to everyone, um, but to pre-2006 land owned by a trustee of a discretionary trust and which is used and occupied by a nominated beneficiary as their principal place of residence. As Irina mentioned before, um, we thought it would be useful to go through a case study that shows how the impact of the increased duty and land tax rates and also the introduction of the windfall gains tax could potentially affect the viability of a development project. Um, we have in this example, Stone Throw, which purchases a vacant block of land in Flinders in January, 2022. So the contract is signed in January, 2022 for $8 million and it intends to subdivide that lot into 50 residential lots. The land is located in a farming zone, so FC at the, type of, at the time of purchase, and the land is not subject to the GAIC. For the purposes of this example, we'll assume that Stone Throw is a foreign purchaser for Victorian duty purposes and is also an absentee owner for Victorian land tax purposes. So what's the stamp duty that's payable in the purchase of, of the property? Um, so under the current rates, the relevant duty rate would be 13.5%. And that comprises the general rate of duty of 5.5% plus the foreign purchaser additional duty of 8%, giving an effective rate of 13.5%. Um, and under the current rates, the amount of duty that would be payable would be around $1.08 million. But in these circumstances, the contract is signed in January 2022. And so the new premium rate of duty of 6.5% would be applied to the value of the property that exceeds that $2 million, plus um, the FPAD of 8% on the $8 million contract price. And therefore the total amount of duty uh, would be $1.14 million, which is $60,000 more than under the current rules. In December, 2022, the land is rezoned from farming zone to urban growth zone, which um, makes its market value increase from $8 million to $75 million. Um, that's an uplift in land value of $67 million. And because the uplift is greater than 500,000, the windfall gains tax is payable on 50% of the uplift. So 50% of that 67, 67 Seven million dollars is thirty-three and a half million dollars, and so the windfall gains tax 
payable on the rezoning of the property is 33. Lastly, stone throw will also be required to pay land tax on the property. And under the new rates of land tax, stone throw will be required to pay an additional $219,000 per year compared to under the current rates of land tax. And over a holding period of five years, this adds up to an additional $1.1 million in land tax, which is also, again, very significant. And so if, if we recap on the case study, stone throw will be required to pay $33.5 million in windfall gains tax, $60,000 in additional duty, and $1.1 million in additional land tax. So in looking at these figures, it's really quite easy to see how the increases in the duty and land tax rates together with the introduction of the windfall gains tax could really render a development project unfeasible. I'll hand over now to Eleanor, who will talk about the payroll tax changes. Thank you, Jess, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, once again, thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar. I will take you through the state budget announcements related to payroll tax. Uh, the state budget had some good news for taxpayers, but also has a proposal to introduce an additional payroll tax surcharge in the form of uh, medical health and well-being levy. As part of my presentation, I will also show some modeling, which we have done looking at how Victorian payroll tax regime compares to other states at the moment. So um, speaking of favorable changes introduced in the state budget commencing from 1st of July, 2021, um, moving, moving on to a first measure, uh, which was brought forward uh, was an increase in the tax-free threshold for payroll tax from 650,000 to 700,000. This will lead to almost 2,500 saving for businesses. I will show, show you shortly what that increase mean and how Victoria compares with other states and territories in relation to its payroll tax-free threshold and rate. Um, the budget also uh, brought forward decrease in payroll tax rate for regional employers from 2.02% to 1.2125%. Now, this change is very beneficial for regional businesses. To qualify for regional rate, business must have more than 85% of their total annual taxable wages payable to regional employees. So employees have to provide services in regional Victoria that is physically be located in regional Victoria. Uh, the challenges we see for some employers to qualify for regional rate is when uh, they have regional operations and a head office in uh, the metro area. The wages payable to head office staff can sometimes be higher than wages to payable to employees working in regional area. Uh, so while the business has more than 85% of people working in regional area, the business can't meet the 85% threshold based on wages paid. Next change uh, relates to businesses with payroll tax liability of 100,000 or less. Uh, such businesses can move to annual reporting and payment of payroll tax from 1st of July, 2021. This measure has uh, uh, been announced in November, 2020 state budget and confirmed in the current budget. This measure will affect businesses with taxable wages from approximately 2.7 million if they qualify for the full threshold or 2 million where business is not entitled to any threshold. Uh, so those businesses can move to annual reporting and payment of payroll tax. And this is an increase from the previous liability threshold of 40,000 per annum. 
The rationale for this measure is uh, to reduce compliance burden for qualifying businesses and improve cash flow for businesses during the year. My understanding is that um, it is optional for businesses to move to annual reporting. If a business wishes to continue to lodge and pay monthly, they still can. Um, moving on to a mental health uh, um, and well-being levy. So in order to implement a range of mental health services as recommended by the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system, the government proposes to introduce a mental health and uh, well-being levy uh, to be imposed from 1st January 2022. Uh, the government will also introduce legislation requiring all revenue raised by the mental health and well-being levy to be specifically directed towards mental health services. So how is it going to work? Uh, the levy is proposed to be imposed as a payroll tax surcharge on Victorian wages paid by businesses with annual Australian group wages above 10 million. So those businesses with annual payroll payrolls above 10 million will pay a surcharge of 0.5% on the value of their wages above 10 million up to 100 million. While those businesses with annual payrolls above 100 million will pay a surcharge of 1% on the value of their wages above 100 million. For employees who are members of a group, the surcharges will be based on the group's total Australian wages. So we understand that the two surcharges will be separately calculated from payroll tax, but they will be included in the same return. All existing payroll tax exemptions for private schools, hospitals, charities, local councils, and um, exemptions for taxable wages such as parental leave, volunteer leave, they will still continue to apply for the purposes of the levy. Uh, one practical issue which um, I can see with the levy is that the introduction of the levy is proposed to be from 1st of January 2022 which is in the middle of payroll tax year. And um, that will lead to a complexity in uh, payroll tax calculations requiring to undertake calculations on a split year basis. So for the first six months and then separately for the remaining six months. So this will increase compliance burden on affected businesses. Usually a change like that would be easier to manage if it was introduced from the beginning of payroll tax year. So for example, from 1st July, 2022. Now, um, moving on, in this table, I wanted to demonstrate the impact of the levy on different size businesses. So I have calculated the levy on businesses with uh, different payrolls. So with businesses with payrolls of 15 million, 50 million, 120 million, 150 million, and 200 million. Uh, you can see from the table that the levy will range from $25,000 on the business with 15 million payroll to almost 1.5 million for the business with 200, uh, 200 million payroll. And this is on top of the payroll tax liability the business is already paying. I have also calculated an increase in the effective payroll tax rate in Victoria if the levy is imposed, as you can see in this green line. Uh, for simplicity of calculations, I have made assumptions that, in a, that a business employs in Victoria only and is entitled to the full threshold. Now, the next table summarizes payroll tax rates and thresholds in each state and territory. This is what I've mentioned before. I have included the new increased threshold for Victoria. Um, please keep in mind that the other states' budgets haven't been handed down yet. Uh, 
also, this is a high level summary and it does not take into account all special rules which exist in many jurisdictions for different levels of taxable wages. Some states have diminishing thresholds, others have uh, increasing rates. Um, so this table doesn't take all these rules into account. It also doesn't take into account regional rates. Uh, looking at this table, you can see that Victoria has the lowest tax free threshold in the country. But what does it practically mean? And how does payroll tax regime in Victoria compares to other states and territories? We have run some calculations and come up with um, the following. I know this, this is a busy table. Uh, what we have done here was uh, we've looked at different size businesses and worked out the payroll tax liability in each state and territory. So these calculations are based uh, on the new payroll tax threshold in Victoria of 700,000, but not yet including the levy. So to give you some idea of approximate size of the business, we worked out the approximate number of employees based on assumption that uh, average wage is $80,000 per annum. And um, uh, so you can see that in a business with payroll of uh, 10 million, um, they may employ approximately 125 employees. So this is just an approximate to give you an idea of the size of the business. And if you focus on the colors in this table, payroll tax liability in Victoria is shown in orange. States and territories with payroll tax liability less than in Victoria are shown in green. And states and territories with payroll tax liability greater than in Victoria are shown in gray. So what we can see on this table is that Victoria is less favorable jurisdiction for smaller businesses with payrolls of approximately 1 million, 1.5 million. Victoria is also less favorable than New South Wales for all business sizes. Um, well, I should point out that until 2020, uh, Victoria, Victoria's payroll tax was lower than in New South Wales. But in the 2020, as part of uh, COVID measures, New South Wales has increased their uh, threshold and decreased their rate. So New South Wales became a more favorable jurisdiction than Victoria from the payroll tax perspective. But apart from New South Wales, uh, as you can see, uh, otherwise across Australia, uh, for medium and uh, large size businesses, Victoria was very competitive. So it was a place to be. Now, when we in, include the levy into the calculation on the next table, this is how the comparison looks when uh, levy is introduced for businesses with uh, Australian group wages over 10 million. So as you can see, the gap between Victoria and New South Wales widens and Victoria becomes even less attractive than New South Wales, particularly for mid to large businesses. Victoria also loses its competitive advantage with some other jurisdictions like uh, Queensland and South Australia. But this is all what I've planned to cover today. So, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the question box. And I think we're going to take our questions, uh, the questions now. Yes, thank you very much, Eleanor, for that presentation. And thank you also to Jess and Irina. There's um, obviously a fair bit in that, and we appreciate um, your patience. Apologies for the slight technical difficulties that we were experiencing during parts of that, uh, just to let you know that you will all be receiving in the coming days a link to the slide pack as well as a link to the recording. So feel free to go th through um, any parts of the presentation that you didn't quite capture there and also to share it with your teams as well. Uh, we have received um, a number of questions which we'll go through in a moment. If you do have any further questions, please feel free to type them into that Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen uh, now. 
Uh, just before we get into questions, um, I just wanted to mention on this current slide, you will see um, a copy of the front page of the bill. The bill has passed the lower house of the Victorian parliament. And actually, as we speak, is being debate, debated within the upper house. So that debate is actually happening at the present time. Um, we do expect that it is likely to pass the upper house, but obviously that's subject to what happens there today. And we'll certainly confirm that in coming days. But please just be aware that all of the measures that we have spoken about that were contained within the bill um, are obviously subject to potential change depending on what may happen today and in coming days within the upper house of the Victorian parliament. So with that, we will jump right into some questions. And the first one is for you, um, Jess. It's in relation to the land tax changes. And could you please just confirm the commencement date of the change in relation to the tax-free threshold? Just take yourself off mute. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Craig. Um, I have a habit of doing that. Apologies. Um, the change applies from 1 January 2022. Fantastic. So the 2022 land tax um, year. The next question, um, and in fact, there's a couple of questions for you, Irina, on the um, windfall gains tax. So can you please confirm that the windfall gains tax is 50% of the windfall gain? Um, the answer is yes, the tax is 50% of the gain or the uplift, uh, where the uplift or gain is $500,000 or more. That's correct. Fantastic. Thank you. And on the same theme, um, in relation to the example that was discussed, where we had a developer that was buying the property in Flinders and then that property being subject to a rezoning, what would happen if that developer pays well above the rates value for that property, what is the amount used to calculate the windfall gains tax? Is it the purchase price that the uh, developer pays for that property or the rating value as determined by the value general? Yeah, it's the latter uh, in short. So it's based on the value of the land immediately before the rezoning and the value of the land after rezoning, where the values are based on a determination by the value of general of Victoria. And you compare the two and the difference is the gain on which the tax will be payable. And if the difference is $500,000 or more, then the tax rate is 50% of that difference. Thank you. So we're receiving a number of questions on this um, issue in relation to calculation that obviously will become very important as we get into the windfall gains tax over coming um, months. Um, as we said at the beginning, uh, all we have currently is a government, a one page government fact sheet. We don't have any legislation. So we're speaking to the government fact sheet and waiting for the legislation that will come out of the consultation process that is about to commence. The next question, Eleanor, is for you in relation to the payroll tax measures. Is the $10 million threshold on grouped wages? Um, yes, it is on grouped wages. So for employers who are members of a group, the surcharges will be based on the group's total Australian wages. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question um, seems to be a combined one in relation to the windfall gains tax and the uh, new payroll tax levy. So it says these measures for the windfall gain tax and the payroll tax levy seem to quickly assess an increase in funds. However, they seem to detract from developing and rezoning in Victoria, as well as locating business in the state. Why is the state government not thinking long term? Okay, so I guess that's um, a bit of a statement as, as well as a, as a question, but um, uh, we completely understand the sentiment there. And as we said, Picture Partners has been quite vocal in the media and via the Property Council and making our views clear that now is not the right time to be imposing these kind of tax increase, particularly the property tax increases and um, more specifically, the windfall gains tax itself. We believe that at this time, as we're coming out of the global pandem pandemic, hopefully, or at least starting to come out of it, that the government should be supporting the property industry rather than imposing further taxes on 
land ownership and uh, development. So um, we appreciate that question. Thank you. Uh, another question regarding uh, the windfall gains tax arena. What is the rule in regards to rezoning from farming to rural living zone where it will be two acre lots? So I, I think that question relates to with a, the general farming zone and then the land moving to a rural living zone, which allows the farmland to be subdivided into two acre lots that can then be sold off to lifestyle purchases, if you like. Yeah, no, thanks, Craig, and thanks for the question. I believe that sounds like it's still a change between zoning types, and therefore I believe, provided that the uplift is $100,000 or more, the windfall gains tax is likely to apply in respect of such an uplift coming from that rezoning. Um, again, we're keen to see um, where the consultation process takes us to, to see if there's sort of exceptions or sort of further details we can find out in respect of particular zoning types, as well as sizes of lands uh, involved, uh, whether they may follow something similar to GAIC where smaller parcels of land may be excluded from the tax. But again, I think it's kind of a watch this space item for the time being. Absolutely, thank you. Um, another question on the windfall gains tax. It's a very popular topic uh, today. <laughs> so will the tax, will the windfall gains tax be deductible to the landowner? So that's an income tax question. And um, Despite the fact that none of us on this call are income tax experts, I'm happy to have a go at that because we have been discussing that internally within our office. The answer, I believe, is at this stage, it's not yet known whether there will be a tax deduction available uh, for the windfall gains tax. We're very much hopeful that it would make logical and practical sense for, um, for a deduction to be available or at least to, for that amount to be recognised as part of the, uh, the cost base for capital gains tax purposes, et cetera, but there are uh, specific provisions that relate to that within the income tax legislation. And obviously Victoria has announced this measure, we understand without any consultation with the federal government in relation to the income tax experts. So please um, watch out over coming days and weeks on our website in particular, and no doubt there will be a bulletin which will cover off on the, uh, the income tax as exp aspects or implications of the windfall gains tax once we get further detail from the state government. And the next question is, is, so is it payable in the same financial year? I think that's again in relation to the windfall gains tax, Irina, as to the uh, when the liability would actually be payable. Right, um, there is an ability or so we've heard about um, deferring that tax. So it might be triggered um, due to a rezoning event but the government has stated that there should be an ability to defer the payment of the windfall gains tax until um, the next dutable transaction of, in respect of the land or subdivision of that land, such that from a cash flow perspective, hopefully that would provide some comfort to developers out there that they might not have to part with the money right away. They can wait till the lots are sold, the cash comes in and then the money or Part of it gets then paid to the government for this windfall gains tax. But as always, we're keen to sort of see the detail in respect of that deferral um, ability. Fantastic, thank you. So that um, that could result in the tax being deferred into a future financial year, depending on when that deferral mechanism kicks in and how long it is until the next dutiable transaction. Uh, so again, on the windfall gains tax, when is the windfall gains tax legislation likely to begin? Well, the answer to that is we don't quite know. Um, what we do know is that the Treasurer announced that he wants it to commence from 1 July 2022 next year. So as I said um, a short time ago, we are about to commence uh, consultation with the Treasurer, uh, the Treasury and the State Revenue Office on the measures. Um, Following that consultation, our expectation is that we will either see draft legislation or possibly just legislation introduced into Parliament for the windfall gains tax uh, measure, which will obviously need to be in time for it to commence on 1 July 2022, if that is still the government's intention. So um, when the legislation comes out, we're not quite sure, but at this stage, based on what we do know, it is... Uh, intended to commence with effect from 1 July next year. 
um, next question or perhaps a statement, this will force a lot of people to liquidate their assets and it has to be paid straight away. Absolutely. So I think the government has at least recognised the cash flow implications of the windfall gains tax in terms of announcing that there will be some form of deferral mechanism. And that's certainly the way that the growth areas and infrastructure contribution applies at the present time. Um, on the triggering of certain GAIC events, there is an opportunity to defer the payment or in some cases spread the payment over the um, sort of stages of development that occur in relation to the relevant land. So we'll have to wait and see for the detail, but we are expecting some form of deferral mechanism. Uh, again, on windfall gains tax, what if the value declines later on? Will we get a refund back from the State Revenue Office, Irina? Um, the short answer is, in my cynical view, I don't believe we will get a, such a refund. But look, again, we'll be looking out for various sort of scenarios. And these questions are great. I keep them coming in respect of the windfall gains tax, because I think it goes to show how much the government has not thought this through. And if value of land declines later whilst remaining with the same landowner, well, technically that gain has never been realized in a sense. Um, and so um, there may be an argument there that you know the windfall gains tax shouldn't apply, but based on what we know now, um, there's nothing indicating that there would be such a clawback or a refund opportunity. Okay, well, that's not very good news, is it? But um, we'll have to, again, we'll have to wait and see for the, for the detail. Um, is the deferral of the windfall gains tax interest free? Um, once again, we won't know that until we um, see the, the legislation from the government as to whether they intend to charge interest or not, um, similar to the, the GAKE, which does have an interest component on the GAKE liability when it's deferred. Um, again, on the windfall gains tax, do you think that developers will just pass on the windfall gains tax to future purchases of land in the development by increasing the cost of new land for purchases? Um, absolutely. That is uh, what we do expect to happen, provided that the project can actually get up and, and, and um, go in the first place. And we are concerned, as Irina and I both said earlier on, about the impact of this new tax on uh, the feasibility of projects, particularly in regional areas, which are um, which are really intended to be um, uh, more suitable in terms of housing affordability and, and some of the cheaper areas to buy land in for consumers, if you like. So um, when land has become more expensive in the GAIC areas, purchases have tended to move out to these regional areas that will now be subject to the, to the windfall gains tax. So we are concerned about the impact of, of projects, but in the event that a developer and a landowner can still get the numbers to stack up. We absolutely expect the windfall gains tax to be factored in, as Irina said, as a development cost that will ultimately then be passed on in some form to the purchases. And based on the numbers we have seen, um, we uh, were in the media a couple of weeks ago saying that we expected prices to rise in some regional areas in excess of $25,000 per lot based on the data that we have available as a result of the windfall gains tax. So a very significant increase. Um, is there any guidance as to land owned prior to the government's announcement? announcement will, will there be an exemption um, in respect of the windfall gains tax? So that's a question, Irina, in relation to transitional measures. Yeah, and that's a great question and one that we have thought about and discussed quite often with uh, people who've been in correspondence with in respect of this new tax. The Treasurer broadly indicated at a property breakfast um, organised by the Property Council in late May that the government recognises a need um, for there to be some form of a transitional arrangement in respect of the windfall gains tax, but we are yet to see the details of that arrangement and I expect that this will be one of the items, if not one of the key items, that will uh, be worked through as part of the consultation process prior to the draft legislation being um, introduced into Parliament. So, so stay, stay tuned is the answer on that one. That will become a very important part of the work that we're doing over the coming months. Um, again, on windfall gains tax, can you object to the value, value of general's valuation? Well, we don't um, exactly know the answer to that, but based on the existing regime for rating and land tax purposes, there is a right to object to the value of the relevant land um, on which rates and land tax is imposed. So our expectation would be that 
there will be some form of objection right contained within the windfall gains tax legislation in respect of the valuations that um, are used. And it's possible that as with land tax, um, if we're going to link it, link it to the value general's valuations that it effectively all just goes back to the rating valuation and you're objecting um, to a valuation that's principally been put together for rating purposes, but then flows into both the land tax regime and the windfall gains tax regime. Um, next question, will the windfall gains tax apply to boundary realignments? I think I can answer that one. Um, based on the, uh, the announcements that we have to date, the answer should be no, um, because that is not a rezoning event where you are, uh, the land is going from one zone category to a different zone category. So our understanding, as Irina said, is that any changes within zones, so from a resident, residential category one to residential category two, for example, or um, with respect to a planning amendment within a zone or a boundary realignment um, in relation to a subdivision, et cetera, that we don't expect the windfall gains tax to be imposed on those situations. Uh, do you see any possibility in obtaining a pre-assessment of rezoning value uplift before the rezoning is finalized? A pre a pre-assessment of rezoning value uplift. So I think that's a question that goes to, can you effectively get an idea um, before the liability crystallizes as to what amount of windfall gains tax you might be up for, Irina? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And I think the short answer is we don't know um, yet. Um, uh, it would be ideal obviously to get an idea before um, the liability is triggered and then crystallized. Um, but again, we just don't know at this stage whether there will be such a possibility um, to do so. We'll, we will obviously look out for um, details and obviously advocate for as many sort of features as possible to help out property owners as part of the consultation process. And this could be one of the things where, again, I think the measure here or the concern behind this is certainty. And obviously everyone wants as much certainty as possible before um, a liability is um, is crystallized and an assessment issued. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Alan, a question for you in relation to the payroll tax um, levy, so the new mental health and wellbeing levy. What is um, Picture Partners view in relation to that levy in terms of, of the level that it kicks in for, for business? Oh, well, uh, Craig, it's a good question. As a business as, and uh, an employer, Picture Partners absolutely supports initiative directed towards additional funding of uh, mental health services. It's vitally important that we have a healthy workforce. However, the introduction of the mental health uh, and well-being levy as a payroll tax surcharge uh, will particularly impact medium-sized businesses in uh, labor-intensive industries at the time when they're potentially still uh, impacted by uh, Victorian lockdown. So uh, we believe that uh, a levy like this uh, may be more justified if it is kicked in at a much higher level. Um, for businesses, say, with annual Australian wages of at least 50 million or more. Um, businesses with wages below this level have less capacity to absorb the costs of the levy, and they need to be encouraged to continue growing and uh, employ new staff. Um, Thank you, Eleanor. Um, Jess, a question on the land tax changes. So with the increases to the land tax rates um, above the $1.8 million threshold, what does that mean for a, for a group, for example, that owns land and, and multiple companies that may be subject to grouping for land tax purposes? Yep, so as we saw from the slides um, in the slide pack, the greater the taxable value of the properties or pro property or properties that you own, the more land tax that you will have to pay. Um, and the effect of land tax grouping is such that your the property holdings of multiple related companies can be aggregated such that they're assessed as though they're held by one landowner. And of course, the downside of that is that um, you don't get to, each company doesn't get to benefit from the lower thresholds of tax. And you're basically paying um, a lot more tax on the amount above 3 million, which is the amount, um, the maximum tax rate. Um, the effect of the tax hikes 
obviously they apply to the higher brackets, which means that you're going to be paying um, even more tax if the properties are grouped. So the effect of the land tax hikes is actually amplified if, if, the, um, if, if you're grouped for land tax purposes. Fantastic. So even more important on a go forward basis to consider your land holding structure and, and the impact yep. of that for land tax purposes. Thanks, Jess. All right. So that's um, that's all the questions that we have currently. Thank you very much. There's some wonderful questions there. Um, a lot of them on the windfall gains tax. Unfortunately, we don't have all the answers at the present time, but we're certainly striving to get those um, for you, as I said, over the coming weeks and months as part of the consultation process that we will be engaged in with the government so please feel free to continue to look at our website for bulletins and updates in relation to these measures um, as i said we will also be sending you in coming days a link to these slides and the recording so you're welcome to go over any of the the questions that we have just answered um, for you um, on that note um, i'd also just like you to invite you to have a think about uh, tuning into the Picture Partners YouTube channel, which does have uh, details of previous um, measures over a, quite a period of time. So if there's anything over previous months or even years that you want to get further detail on, please go to our website, have a look at that, and also um, join up to the Picture Partners YouTube channel. But I would like to very much thank Alana, Irina and Jess for your presentations um, this afternoon. Very informative, um, appreciate your time. And would also like to thank Angeline and Bella in the background and our client experience team for putting this um, presentation together. And finally and importantly, thank you all very much for your attendance today. We very much do appreciate you tuning in. Um, we wish you all the very best for the remainder of the lockdown. Let's hope we get some good news um, from our government over com coming days and release us, release us in some form from this lockdown. Please um, stay safe and well. And if you've got any further particular questions about these or other measures, please feel free to reach out to your regular Picture Partners contact. Thanks, everyone, and good afternoon.